welcome back. Today we're looking at setting up a Synology NAS for the first time. This is a uh, 223, so it's a two bay from model year 2023. Some of the uh, features that stand out on this one, which are quite annoying actually, is it only has a single one gigabit uh, network interface, which is uh, kind of annoying. I, I really do think these should all be like minimum 2.5 gigabit. Obviously we have the uh, the front bay. The front bay just pulls off with these kind of like little rubbery sort of bungs. They kind of just wedge themselves into the corners and hold it in place and do a fairly good job to be honest. And then we have the sled. I'm actually just going to put a couple of really old uh, desktop drives that I've got, uh, which aren't suitable for NAS at all, but I, I'm doing this so that we can just get started and then we can show how to fix that later as well. The SATA connector needs to be the bit that's facing into the disk station. Uh, so when we put it in, you've got a handle side and an empty side, put it in that way. Probably have to slide it in, there you go. Make sure it's sat in the right place. Okay, and then we have some little locks. Uh, these, they sort of line up with the holes on your hard drive and they just help hold it in place. So we'll just lock them in. And if they don't go in, it means you didn't get it in the right place because <laughs> they're not hard to get in. That's because the drive wasn't in the right place. The drive wasn't far enough back in and it just sort of clicks. And this one. And then they just sort of click in place. And to be honest, they're quite easy to put on. Um, I'm probably making more of a mess of that because I'm leaning to the side whilst I'm doing it. I have no idea how the YouTube community does this stuff so well. So this is another old drive. This one is a one terabyte. That other one is 500 gig. Let's put that back on there. So. There we go, locked in place. And first one up. They should just click in place, just like that. Let's put these in. Uh, we're gonna make a Synology hybrid RAID, or I think it's like a RAID, kind of like a RAID one. And that's gonna be limited to the smallest size disks that we put in. So it doesn't matter which order I put these in because they're both gonna register as like 500 gig essentially. There is a little arrow on the handle that tells you which side is up. In fact, it says up. So they're in. This sort of just clicks over the top, I promise. This sort of sits there. Got a standard Ethernet cable going directly into a switch under the table and a standard power. Uh, right, okay, so that is the device. We'll turn it on and then we'll see what it does. Find or finds, plural. No Synology device found on the LAN. That's fine, it was still booting up, so let's give it another go. No, there is the opportunity to download the Synology Assistant. I've never needed it so far. Okay, it's beeping now, so that probably means it's ready to be found, or not. <laughs> it may be because I'm inside a private browsing session. Let's bring up a different browser a second. Okay, so that might have been because I was in a private browsing session. Let me just see. Okay, so interesting to note a private, you know, private window in Safari at least was unable to find it, whereas a just regular Brave browser session was able to find it. So what we will do is we will go to that uh, and we'll get it set up. So we'll accept the the terms the end user license agreement. Of course, as with all things, you've paid your money, you've bought it, but you don't actually own it, or you don't own the software that makes it do anything interesting, or modern things anyway. So we're gonna accept it, because this is basically accepting the license agreement for the operating system, which will be installed as part of this. So let's uh, let's install, oh, automatically download it. Data will be deleted on drives one and two. Yep, that's fine into your product model. I have no idea why it asks you to do that. I mean, it tells you what to write. And then it will install the uh, Disk Station Manager or DSM. Now, this will take a little bit of time. Okay, now we've got a 10 minute wait whilst it does whatever it does. 
Okay, looks like it's getting ready to go. One of the interesting things uh, for me is going to be the fact that this is, um, these are two old drives. So what it might do, one of the first things I might stumble into is when it tells me that these are unhealthy drives, but we will find out soon. All right, so welcome to DSM 7.2, next generation data management begins here. Wow, see what's new? Oh, no. Watch like all this one, call it my bulb cube two, even though it's not a cube. Uh, select an update option. Okay, so I want it to uh, automatically install important DSM and package updates. Um, so these are kind of security fixes. Um, don't necessarily want everything that comes straight off if they're just new features, not, not always interested in that. And the notification, there's a high chance I might just forget about that and then, uh, you know, miss some important security thing. As it is recommended, I would also go with that one. Create a Synology account. I already have a Synology account. It's definitely a good idea to create one. Okay, so I logged in using my existing Synology account. Right, okay, so Quick Connect is very useful for things like uh, Synology Photos, for example, um, DS Audio. So it uh, essentially allows you to have your photos in the cloud, so to speak, but you are actually just using the Quick Connect service to reach your own NAS device and then connect it into that. Okay, so other useful things. Uh, Synology Active Insight, I think that's quite useful actually. I, I get notifications in the mobile app that tells me when there are you know, issues with my drives or when there's been a sudden power drop. Support center diagnosis service. It's a good idea to back up your DSM configuration. I ticked both of these last time. I personally am interested in this support center thing, but the other three are quite useful as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Not what it remembers that for. <laughs> right, okay, so these are some of the things we wanna work on a bit later on. You've got securely access and share files from anywhere. Do we want to do that now? Let's not do that now. Let's just go through some of the setup stuff. Enable two-factor, I think it's a good idea. I'm not going to do it right now. So actually, it's trying to tell you what to do from the very beginning. So let's go in and create a storage pull and volume and it'll probably help us understand a little bit about our uh, device as well. Start to create a storage pool, yep. Okay, that's fine. Ah, okay, so here we're being asked what type do we want. Okay, so we could have the SHR. This is the recommended RAID type for beginners. I think JBOD is where you, you just combine, combine the, the drives. So SHR and RAID 1 are kind of the same, I think. I don't know what basic is. RAID 0 is where they're striped. So if you have one piece of data on two disks, let's say the, the alphabet, Letter A goes on one disc, letter B goes on the second disc, letter C goes on the third disc, letter D goes on the fourth disc, etc, etc. The problem with that is if you lost one of those discs, you've only got half the data and therefore you've got none of the data because you can't really figure out what's missing. SHR and RAID 1 are kind of the same, I think, so it's basically like a mirror. Uh, you write A, B, C, D to one disc and then it's basically copied or also written to the second disc. So if you lost one of the discs, you can just take it out, you put a new disc in, it will copy all of that data over from the, the one that was still working onto the new one, and therefore you still have a one-to-one -one copy of the original data, and therefore you don't really lose anything. The problem with that, if it is a problem at all, is you essentially have half the storage. So I put one and a half terabytes worth of storage into this, and if I could get half of it, I would have 0.75 terabytes of actual usable storage. Now, there is a slight problem with that in that these types of raids, they need the disks to be the same size. So I think this, this, I don't know what that one is, and this, they all need to be the same size. Essentially, I'm going to get whatever the weakest drive is in my machine. So I'm gonna get like 500 gigabytes worth of storage, and the other 500 gigabytes on that large disk is basically doing nothing, it's just useless. The JBOD is where it just stacks them on top of each other, so I think I would have the full one and a half terabytes. Maybe that's okay if you're just using it as data storage and you've got somewhere else that backs it up. Maybe you wanna use this one as data storage and then you back this up to another NAS, maybe that's fine. Um, but anyway, for me, I'm gonna use SHR. So this is what it sees in there. It tells It tells me to select at least one drive that I want to build with my SHR. I'm gonna say both of them. And um, we can see one's got 465 
4.8 gigabytes of usable space and the other one's got 931. In total, I'm actually gonna end up with 455.5 gigabytes. I'm guessing the other 10 gigabytes the OS and the error checking, that kind of stuff. Please not the following. Okay, so this is quite interesting and this is actually kind of like the thing that the Synology stuff's all in the news for at the moment. The drives I've put in are not on the compatibility list. The problem at the moment is if you bought a 95 plus, the compatibility list only has Synology listed drives. For the 223, which I'm using here, there are lots of drives that are on that compatibility list, but these two are just too old. I'm not gonna lose anything. Do I wanna do a drive check? Nope, I don't want to. It's a good idea too, but I don't want to at the minute. Storage pool, we'll let it have the max. Um, volume description, didn't I already say it was a Borg cube? Oh no, that was my storage pool, wasn't it? But you can't guess what my first one's called. Uh, and these are the file systems. You've got Butter, BTRFS. EXT4 is pretty good because it can be read by lots of other operating systems. I'd go with the recommended one there. So we're going to create a storage pool called the Ball Cube 2. It's going to be a Synology hybrid RAID using SATA hard disk drives. Drive 1 and Drive 2. Estimated capacity will be 455 gigabytes. We are ready to go. Okay. We'll do a quick erase. It doesn't take very long to do this. So I don't want to go through the uh, quick tour. I'm not really interested in that. We've got DSM settings recovery. It's saying it's found some, and this will essentially pull them from my other NAS, but the other one's different, so I don't want to do that. So it thinks we're healthy, which is nice. Two drives. We click on them, it'll take, them, take us to that drive. It's healthy at 30 degrees. Okay, so it thinks they're both healthy, so that's nice. Okay, so there are some things we need to do. We want to set up data scrubbing. That's storage pool one, that's fine. I'm going to do it every three months. Do I want to do it at any time or do I want to do it when the device isn't busy? So that's what I'm going to say. Pause data scrubbing between the hours of 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. And then it can do it throughout the rest of the night. That's fine. Uh, we also want to uh, create a schedule to empty our recycle bin and we should set up snapshots. So let's go and do those. Okay, looks like we've already got some updates here. This, this little red badge. So let's have a look. All right, okay, so these are some of the things that we might want. Let's have a look what we've got in there. What we probably want to do is think about setting up some users and groups, but I don't want to go too far into that for now because there are some things I want to do on this a little bit later on. So we want to create a shared folder. So we'll call it the shared folder. Description, volume one. Do we want this in my network places? So this is, if you have Windows, I don't think this would work on a Mac. In Windows, when you click on, you know, my network or whatever it's the network places icon, you'll be able to see Borg Cubo 2 and then you'll be able to see the folders that are shared. If you want, you can hide them. I don't want to encrypt the folder. Quota might be useful. This is only a small disk, but I'm gonna give it 100 gigabytes for now. It just means that we can't go more than 100 gigabytes. It doesn't lose us 100 gigabytes right now. It just means that that folder can't grow more than that. Now really, what I need to do is create some users. I should have done that already. So let me just ignore that for now. Come back to our users and groups. Right, so the inbuilt admin account is deactivated and the guest account is deactivated and just the admin account that I created is, is available. So I normally would create users and groups. Let's create a, a user for now. Create one called what the flash. You don't need the email address. You do need a password. So we've got a user, they're going to be in the default user group at the moment. I'm not really bothered about user permissions because I don't like to do permissions on a, on a per user basis. What I would like to do is create a group. So we will create a group called DRP WTF. Who's going to be a member? This dude is going to be a member. What folder they, they have, they're going to have access to read and write of that shared folder. Quarter per member, it doesn't really matter. Uh, and then what applications are they going to be allowed? So we haven't got many applications on here yet, so probably not something we have to worry about just at the moment. Um, but later on, when we've got things like uh, Synology Photos or something, we would want to allow them or deny them access. We'll ignore that. File station, 
confirm FTP and rsync. So now we've got a group and a user. But enable the user home service. We look inside our, uh, once we've applied it, and we've got the recycle bin. If we look inside our file station now, which is just this icon here, we can see Bog Cube has home, which is my account that I'm logged into right now. This is my home. And in homes, these are all of the users that exist. So this is kind of just like in Mac OS or Linux, you would probably see this. And Windows, they just have different names. So I think in Windows, it would be like C Drive users and then there would be like david so this c slash users this is this what this homes is okay so in linux that would be something like slash home and then you know david what we're looking at here this slash home is slash home slash admin dave homes would be this bit of it okay and that's the same with that windows one so we had c drive i think it's users slash that's basically what we're saying here so these aren't two different folders. They are the same folder. They're just, uh, well, they're not the same folder. This is like the parent of this. Homes, it should really say street or town or something, shouldn't it really? And then it should say home. <laughs> and then you've got the shared folder, which uh, is just for everyone else. So typically in like Windows, that would be something like C users, all users, or, or maybe shared or something. And I think on a Mac, it would be slash home slash shared. I think it is actually. But anyway, that's what, that's what we're looking at here. These are basic settings to find the device. So on my Mac, I should be able to type this. To log into this, I would need to have that the flash was the user I created and my password. Okay, and then it popped up another one and now it's asking me. So this was Finder asking me which thing I want to connect to. Do I want to connect to Home, Homes or Shared Folder? If I look at Home and if I create a folder called uh, Test. So here I am working inside the Mac and I'm going to create a file. Search my dog is blue.jpg. Um, we should have this file here that doesn't actually have anything in it. And then if we go back into the or cube. If I look inside, oh, I'm logged in as, as myself as the admin Dave account, but if I look inside homes, because the admin can see everything, okay, uh, and then I look inside this user, and then I look inside their test folder, and then I can see that their dog is indeed blue. Windows can access this as well. I don't have a Windows machine with me right now, so I can't show it. So, interestingly, one of the things that you could do here is you could enable a time machine broadcast. So now, again, in Mac OS, it told me I can create my time machine on the home folder of this if I want. And then you've got other things like file transfer protocols, that kind of stuff. Not really interested in any of that at the minute. Domain and LDAP, we can join it to a domain uh, if we have one. So the snapshot, the way it was described to me was Let's say one of your family members goes out and downloads something a little bit dodgy and that dodgy thing encrypts, starts encrypting home folders or shared folders. With a snapshot, you could roll back to the day before that happened, essentially. Um, so it is quite a useful thing. And we definitely should look at having this. Okay, so we've got our folders. Let's enable a snapshot. So we want to keep all snapshots for, let's say, 30 days. I'm going to just say 30 days. Keep the latest snapshot of the hour for 24 hours. Keep the latest snapshot of the day. This will be interesting to see how big this gets quite uh, a little bit later on. Uh, right, okay. So that was basically setting up your device for the first time. We've got a healthy system. So I'm going to leave it there because I actually want to make a different video where we look at some of these packages and what we could do with them, some of the clever stuff we could do. Thanks very much for watching this one today. If there is anything you want to know more about or you think I just kind of waffled through a little bit, if you let me know, I can sort of do a follow up where we sort of go through it a little bit better. I hope you found something useful in here. I'll see you on the next video.